it's interesting because I could hear birds chirping in the front of the house. Back here, it's a much different sound. Yeah, you hear that droning and there it is. This is all you hear. So how often do you come outside to have dinner now? Uh, we, we just uh, come uh, outside two times this year. All year? Yeah. Because of Be this? Because of this. It's hard to sleep at night when you have that constant buzzing sound, that, 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 that's, that noise. Even as you're speaking about this, I can see you getting a bit more tense. Yes. You seem really irritated. Well... Yeah, like pissed off. Oh, it's there 24-7. It won't stop. It never stops. House values are going down, of course, and it's the reality, right? You, you're not going to buy a house that's so close to a constant noise. And neighborhood noise, as you just heard, is just one of the unforeseen effects caused by the rapid expansion of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin mining. Now, I spoke to Neha Narula, the director of the Digital Currency Initiative, about what may lie ahead as blockchain continues to grow. Neha, thanks for your time today. I want you to act as our kind of futurist here and explain what the potential benefits very well could be uh, from cryptocurrencies. Well, uh, first of all, happy to be here. I think it's really important to take a look at money in our financial system. Uh, you know, really, our financial system hasn't changed that much in hundreds of years. And what we're seeing now is we're seeing a technology that has the potential to completely change the way that we transact and the way that we create value. And that's really exciting. Uh, part of what I work on is uh, technology that's going to help us do for finance and value what the internet did for information. Which would be democratize it, right? Make it more accessible to more people. One fascinating idea you have that you've mentioned is that perhaps these programmable um, currencies would allow people to sell their own data rather than accessing websites like Facebook for free and allowing those companies to sell it. How would that work exactly? Yes, so what's really exciting about this technology is that we're marrying software with money. And when you marry software with money, then you can control how that money moves around um, and how it's transferred in really interesting different ways. Uh, so one example I like to talk about is the idea of being able to control exactly how your data is used and to get compensated for the way that your data is used. Uh, so this requires a lot of different things actually in order to work. Uh, it requires some kind of form of programmable money. It also um, requires some uh, interesting ways of proving and controlling how data is actually uh, computed upon. Uh, so there's a cryptographic primitive called zero knowledge proofs, which can help a lot with this type of thing. It's really exciting technology. It's a way of being able to prove something about your data or some quality of that data without actually revealing what that data is. So um, you can imagine kind of putting all of these different technologies together and um, you know me being able to share my data with a company or with many different companies and instead of just revealing that data to them and letting them aggregate it all in one place, instead I let them compute on it without actually getting to see what it is. And so all that they get is an is an aggregated answer from a bunch of different people. And what this means is that it doesn't actually reveal anything about my individual data. So the high level idea here is that when we start to combine all of these different things together, and an important part of that is, I think, a way of transferring value, doing things like micropayments, um, transferring money according to conditions that can't be subverted, then we start to create a whole new platform. We start to create a platform where we can build all sorts of types of things on top of money and software. I want to ask you a bit more of a philosophical question because as cryptocurrencies gain traction, blockchain technology proves its worth, it is an extremely power intensive um, process. Canada seems to have extra hydropower. It's willing to sell to Bitcoin mining companies. We just looked at Wenatchee in Washington state, which is much more cautious. Do you feel any sense of hesitation that something that isn't tangible requires so much electricity? 
So I think you know you kind of have to go back and think about money. You know, you mentioned something tangible. Um, you know, money isn't necessarily something tangible. Sometimes we use coins or stones or pieces of paper, but oftentimes money is just ones and zeros that's moving around the world. Um, and like you know that form of money, which is usually facilitated through banks, cryptocurrencies are also ones and zeros that are just moving around the world. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, who was the creator of Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency, had a vision that we would all participate in the Bitcoin network using our computers that we have at home. The idea was one CPU, one vote, and we would all work together to create this ledger of transactions. Now, what so Satoshi didn't anticipate is, this, is the fact that when you have a system where there are incentives, people are gonna work really hard in order to make money. And that's what's happened with Bitcoin mining. People have figured out how to create very specialized hardware that can participate in the Bitcoin network more effectively. Uh, and the major cost for running this hardware is electricity to keep the hardware going. And so what we've seen is absolutely fascinating. We've seen a very interesting hardware market develop. We've also seen people go out in search of the cheapest energy that they can possibly find. And that's probably what's happening in Canada right now. People are looking for places to build giant data centers that are full of this specialized hardware in order to have access to this cheap electricity to run the hardware and participate in the Bitcoin network and to make money. It effectively sounds like the energy factor is not something that concerns you. Well, I wouldn't say that it doesn't concern me. I, it does concern me. However, I'm not as worried about it as you might think because I really think that right now we're still in the beginning phases of this technology okay. and I'm confident that we're going to be able to figure out new ways of reaching consensus on a ledger of transactions. So right now the energy expenditure is due to a process called proof of work. All of these computers are spinning, are consuming this energy, trying to find the answer, a random answer to a puzzle. Um, that is one way of reaching consensus on a ledger of transactions and of proving that you know, you've expended a lot of effort in order to do so. But um, I think that there are other methods that researchers are working on that are much, much, much less energy intensive. So it's entirely possible that we'll look back on this period um, as just that, a short period in which there was a high amount of energy expenditure that we then sort of evolved beyond. And I think we just have to keep reiterating that this is such early days for this technology in many ways it is untested. But on that point, I know you've compared it to the early days of the automobile, uh, which of course we had some unforeseen consequences as well with CO2 emissions, climate change, uh, the dangers of driving or being hit by a vehicle in an accident. What might be some of the potential unforeseen issues that this technology creates? That's a great question. So uh, as I said before, I think that the creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi, really did not predict this hardware market that would develop. Um, you know, Satoshi had no idea that people would develop all of this specialized hardware, would be searching the ends of the earth for cheap energy. So we've already seen some really unexpected things come out of this technology. And I think there's probably a lot more to come, unfortunately. It's kind of a feature of any new technology that um, really has an impact upon the world that uh, with the good comes some bad. There are often unintended consequences. And the best thing we can do is to try to be very critical, to try to take a look at what's going on, to think about the effects of the technology that we're creating. Uh, there's a movement right now to think about ethics in artificial intelligence. I think we need the equivalent for cryptocurrencies. We also need to think about ethics and consequences as a result of this new technology that we're developing. For people interested to find out more and to avoid you know, scams on the internet, where would you encourage people to look? And learn. Unfortunately, the uh, the information in this area it's still being aggregated. You know, we're still such early days. Um, I think that it's important to make sure that you're listening to trusted sources. Um, it's also important to think about the financial interests of the experts that you do listen to. So one thing that's kind of unique about this space is that a lot of people who are the most well versed in the technology 
are also selling the technology or are, have some kind of token that they're offering for sale to the public. So it's important, you know, it's really important to make sure that you're thinking about the financial incentives of the people behind um, sort of the recommendations and the research and the literature. Uh, in my group at MIT, we try to stay somewhat financially neutral. We own very sort of um, limited amounts of cryptocurrency, if any. And so I, and I think that that's, you know, kind of something that a lot of academics, a lot of journalists also pride themselves on. So, you know, just keep in mind the financial incentives of the people that you're listening to. Right. To, even though the technology may change, there'll always be someone with a bridge to sell you. Now it's just a digital mm -hmm. bridge. Neha <laughs> Narula, speaking to us from the MIT Media Lab, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you.